Thank you, Lord. Hey, please take your seats. Just say, Matthias, that God wants to do good things with us. God wants to speak to us. God wants to speak to you. And it may be that sometimes we come to church services, we come to conferences, we come to Christian events, and we're saying, hey, Jesus, get the guy to pick me out. Get the guy to pick me out and, and say what my name is and say what my birthday is and say what color my underwear is. Because sometimes people do things like that. They say, oh, God, I want somebody to pick me out. I just want you to know this evening, Jesus has picked you out. And he wants to speak to you. He wants to speak to me. It's fantastic that God has such a huge heart to see his kingdom come. To make sure I organize myself. I just want to say what a privilege it has been to be here at Brighter again. It's a joy. Thank you, Jesper. Thank you for the team who've invited me. Thank you for John for looking after us so well. It's been a privilege to be here. And you know, I was thinking, this isn't really a conference. It feels like a community. But actually, I was saying and praying this afternoon, saying, what, what, what's God, Jesus, what are you doing with Brighter? This isn't a conference. Actually, it's more than a conference. It's more than a community. Do you know, it's a movement. There's a movement happening here. It's not just about you. It's not just about friends. It's about what God is doing through a movement. Denmark can be revolutionized through a movement like Brighter. And I want to... I want to tell you right off, because I was so excited with, with that song. It was so great because I want to talk. And I'm going to tell you where I'm going to end, okay? In a moment, we're going to do a little bit of history, a little bit of geography, a little bit of Old Testament. But before we get to the Old Testament, because sometimes people preach in church and say, let's turn to the Old Testament. And we think, oh, switch off. So we're going to get to the Old Testament in a moment, but I want to tell you why. I want to tell you where we're going to end up, because this morning I talked about two camps of people. I talked about a type of Christian that sort of is over here, and this Christian, although they love Jesus, in society, in the culture of today, they behave the same as everybody else. They're supposed to be a Christian, maybe they love Jesus, but they're very quiet, they're very shy, they hide their faith. Although they know Jesus, they're a little bit of ashamed of Jesus. And their lifestyle is the same as the culture around them. And so they behave exactly the same as every other person in society. Although they're a Christian, they live the same as the non-Christians. That really is not holy living. There's no holiness there. Holiness is about being set apart for God. And when you look through the Old Testament and talk about holiness, it's not just about being clean. We think that holiness is about being clean, about not being naughty and not doing bad things. But no, no, no. Holiness, first of all, is about being set apart, being called out, being distinct. And if you're a follower of Jesus and you behave exactly the same as all your other friends at school or work or college or wherever you are, if you behave the same, there's no holiness because you're not distinct. To be holy is to be set apart. And so over here, there's no holiness. But over this side, this is very, very Christian. We're a little bit nervous of the world out there. We're scared of the world. It's a big world. It's a nasty world. And so all us Christians, we group together. And we're so holy that we never have anything to do with the society around us. So how can we be ambassadors to the world if we don't connect with the world? And so over here, it is a very, very fragile holiness. It's a weak holiness. I'm very, very scared that if I spend time with my, my non-Christian friends, um, that actually they will infect me. I will lose my holiness if I have too much time with people who are not Christians. This is a weak holiness. That far side is no holiness, 
But this is a weak holiness. It's a fragile holiness. We are all very scared and waiting to go to heaven. Do you know any churches like that? There's no sense of God is going to use us in this nation. God is going to use us today. There's no thought of that. No, no, no. Oh, let's hold on. Let's wait till we go to heaven. We're very holy and we have nothing to do with the nasty world. We might as well be in heaven. And so one extreme is no holiness. The other extreme is a weak holiness, a fearful holiness, where Christians live in fear and just huddle with other Christians. But here in the middle is a robust holiness, a strong holiness, a confident holiness that says, yes, I am called out and I stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. But I stand not hiding away with other Christians, but I stand in the culture of today. I am in this world, as Jesus' prayer of John 17 says. I am in this world. I'm not hiding from this world, but I am not of the world. I'm called out and sent into this world for Jesus' sake. So that's where we're going to end. But let me start with a little bit of Old Testament. Exodus chapter 13. Exodus chapter 13. This is an Old Testament story and you know that the children of Israel have been uh, imprisoned really. They've been uh, in slavery in Egypt and they're coming out of Egypt and they come to a place where they will shortly cross the Red Sea. But listen to this from Exodus 13 verse 17. Exodus 13 17. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road towards the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt armed for battle. And so the Israelites have been in slavery in Egypt. They've been released from Egypt and they're on the way to the promised land Canaan. Now, if we try to look at this on a map, let me try. How's that? Let's look at this on a map. Is that okay? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Ooh, oh, whoa, oh, that's a bit different. Have we got the other map? The one we did before? No, the one that I put in originally. Because that's not going to help us. Okay, that's not quite going to... Okay, let's go back, let's go back then. <laughs> okay, now the next one. Yeah, let's go with that. It's, you can't really see it so well, this small. It's a shame we didn't keep the other map, guys, but still, let's, let's move on, let's move on. Um, so, there's a little tiny line in there. I tell you what, let's not bother with the map. Um, from Egypt to Canaan is a very straight line. You can take the highway from Egypt to Canaan. There is like the main highway. That is the way to go. That would have been the obvious way to go. But in actual fact... They did not travel that way. They went a long way round. Maybe that was the one you were going to show us. The long, long way round. You see how far, this is where the children of Israel traveled. Way further than they needed to go. Why did they do that? I'll tell you why. Because if they had gone on the coast road, they would have gone through the territory that was protected by the Philistines. The Philistines were the high-tech enemy of the day. Back in this sort of period, maybe 1200, 1300 BC, the most fearsome enemy you could ever meet 
The most fearsome enemy was the might of the Philistine army. This is part of the Bronze Age and the Philistines had come across from the other side of the Mediterranean and they'd settled all along the coast here. And so therefore, the road that Israel should have gone, the main road, the quickest route from, from, uh, uh, from uh, Can- no, to Canaan from, uh, from Egypt, the quickest route they would have gone would have taken them right through the middle of the Philistine territory. Now, let's read again what we said. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. Okay? You getting that? They could have gone through the Philistine country because that was shortest, but God did not guide them that way. He said if they face war, they might change their minds and go back to Egypt. So God instead led them through the desert. And if you know the Old Testament, they had enough problems there. But God protected them from going through the Philistine country. The interesting thing is the very last phrase of verse 18 says, the Philistines went up out of Egypt armed for battle. Armed for battle. The, the real, it's written in Hebrew, this Old Testament, and it actually says in battle formation. So let's get the picture. The children of Israel, God's people, been released out of Egypt. They come out and they're on the way to the promised land. And the promised land is that away. Come on, guys, that away. But they think they can do it. They are armed for battle. They're in battle formation. And so the children of Israel say, come on, guys, we can do it. And somebody must have come and said, hey, The Philistines are there. They are the most fearsome, scariest enemy of the day. They have the high-tech weapons. The Philistines are that way. But these children of Israel said, come on, we can do it. They went up in battle formation. They thought they could do it. But you know what? God knew they couldn't. And so here's the lesson. The lesson is that although God's people thought they could take on the Philistines and win, God knew they could not. So what did he do? He guided them through, instead, through the desert. He went a different way around. In fact, if we look at Deuteronomy chapter 8, it says a little bit more there. So in Deuteronomy chapter 8, it actually is telling us after what had happened, telling us a little bit more again. And Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 2 says, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert for 40 years to humble you, to test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes did not wear out and your feet did not swell during these 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God was disciplining you. So I hope you've got that little bit of Old Testament history geography in your mind. Because the children of Israel came out of Egypt and the fastest ray to the promised land took them through enemy territory. But they thought they could do it. Come on, guys, we can do this. But God knew they would get wiped out. So instead, he took them through the desert. And what could have taken them six weeks took them 40 years. But Deuteronomy has just told us why. Because God wanted to discover what was in their hearts. He caused them to hunger And then miraculously provided for them. Did you hear that? God caused them to hunger. What? Caused them to hunger. I thought God was a nice guy. I thought God was going to give me lovely things all the time. I thought, I'm sure the evangelist said to me, come to Jesus and all your problems will be over and you'll have a lovely life. What? The evangelist lied. Because God said, I caused my people to hunger. And then I miraculously provided for them so that they would trust in me. See, this is tough holiness that God is working into their lives. And so here's the principle and here's the key and here's the theme. We want to say, your Lord knows when to lift you and when to leave you. Your Lord knows when to lift you and when to leave you. 
You see, the children of Israel thought that they could take on the enemy. But God says, no, 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 no. So he lifted them out of that problem. God knew that the problem of the Philistines would be so severe that they could not manage. So God said, no, 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 you cannot take on something that you're not going to win. So he lifted them out of that situation. But if you know your Old Testament, whoa, they had their problems in the wilderness. In the desert, they had problems. So God left them in. And I want to encourage you this evening that your Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, is so wise that he knows when to lift you out of something that you cannot manage and when to leave you in it. He knows when to protect you and when for your sake alone he allows you to maybe get a little bit hurt because he wants you to be stronger. Jill and me have got three kids and one of them, especially when he was young, he was really, really mischievous. He was really naughty. He's in his 20s, he's still mischievous, he's still naughty. But I'll never forget the number of times when he would do something naughty when he's like this big. But it was so funny. It was naughty, but it was funny. And as a dad, I sometimes had to go in the other room and laugh and laugh and laugh and then come and tell him off. Because it was funny and it was naughty. One of the things he did when he was four, he fell in love with fire. He just likes fire. He used to get hold of matches. He used to like setting fire to things. You should see him after a barbecue. Oh, he used to enjoy that. He would go out and he would put grass on the smoldering coals. Woo, that's fun. Then he'd get some more grass. And as a parent, I did not want to stop him because a bit of adventure is good. God wants a little bit of adventure in his church. Don't you hate it when the church is boring? When everything about the church is, no, no, don't, don't. And I was determined not to be a parent that says, don't, no, don't, no. no. And so Jill and me would watch Johnny sometimes setting fire to things. He would just experiment. He would throw some grass on. Ooh, he would find a little bit of paper. Ooh, he would try a banana barbecuing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I want him. And once, once or twice he got hurt. And I'd be looking out and I'd see him and he'd do something and whoosh, and he would burn the little hairs on his hand. Ah. Oh. Did I enjoy seeing my son get hurt? No. But he, he needs to learn. It helped him to grow to be stronger. Then one day I saw him walking towards the barbecue with next door's cat. And I had to step in and say, no, 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 no. You can't barbecue next door's cat. <laughs> Just why? <laughs> you see, a wise parent sometimes will let their children have a little bit of adventure, even if possibly they might get a little bit hurt. But a wise parent will always step in and say, hey, hey, hey not past there. And God your father, God, is the wisest parent there possibly is. And what's saying here in Deuteronomy is that God lifted them out of a situation. They thought, come on, we can take on the Philistines. We can do it. But God says, no, 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 no. So God stepped in and protected them. He knows when to lift you out of a situation that will kill you. Something that will do irrevocable damage to you. God will lift you out. But there's other times when he might leave you in because he wants you to learn. He wants you to grow. It's so important. This applies to temptation. There's a little verse in 1 Corinthians 10. Quite a well-known verse, this, in 1 Corinthians 10. Verse 13. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man, common to everybody. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will always provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. You see what God is saying there? 
He says, when you are tempted, when you have a temptation, when something comes in uh, and and tempts you to, to not be holy, to not live a life pleasing to God, God says, there is always a way out. No temptation has hit you that is not common to others. And God is faithful. He will always, always provide a way out. And so this is the truth. If he's left you in it, you can cope. If you can't cope, he'll take you out of it. That little verse, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, in a more contemporary English translation, says he will provide a way of escape. He will provide a way of escape. If God has left you in it, you can cope. If you can't cope, he'll take you out of it. I got a friend, just one friend, and many years ago he came to faith in Jesus and he had three problems. He swore very badly. He blasphemed, he said lots of bloodies and lots of other words. Anyway, so he was not good in language. But also, he smoked cigarettes loads and loads and loads, 40, 50, 60 a day smoking cigarettes. And also, he drank alcohol a lot. So, bad language smoking loads of cigarettes and alcohol, lots and lots of it. Apart from that, it was okay. (laughs) But then he came to faith in Jesus. And a couple of weeks after he was following Jesus, he was at work and one of his friends came to him and said, hey, why have you changed your language? He says, what What language? He says, you're not swearing anymore. You're not throwing in all the swear words and blaspheming. What's happened? What's happened? And do you know, he suddenly thought, oh yeah, I'm just not doing it anymore. Wow. He didn't try, he didn't think about it. The other thing he had realized is from when he chose to follow Jesus, his desire for alcohol just went. He was having loads of alcohol before then, loads of beer, loads of whiskeys and shorts. And and suddenly he thought, I don't like the taste. Do you know what he would say? He's been a follower of Jesus now for many, many years, been a pastor. He would say that when he chose to follow Jesus, somehow or other, God sent him the strength so that almost immediately his language changed and his desire for alcohol disappeared. But you know what? For years, he struggled to conquer smoking. For years. And he would explain it like this. God knew that he needed some help. So by his Holy Spirit, God took away the desire for alcohol and took away the bad language, but left him with the struggle of cigarette smoking. He conquered it, but some years later. But you know what he would say? His character grew by conquering smoking. His character did not grow when the alcohol and language were taken from him. In other words, the Lord knew what to take away from him. And the Lord knew what to leave with him. You see, I hear that somebody could say, well, hang on. Is God short of power? If God has enough power, why can he not take all three? Can he not take the alcohol and the language and the cigarette? Can he not take all three? Did he run out of power? Were there only two angels available? The angel that helps people with smoking was busy that day. What's going on here? No, no, no. The key is this. God sometimes leaves us with things. Because that's how we grow when we conquer them. I hear many, many Christians saying, we're going to be overcomers. I want to be an overcomer. We are called to be overcomers. Do you know how you become an overcomer? By having something that you have to come over. And that's how you become an overcomer. You've got to come over something to be an overcomer. And so we have something in our hearts. I won't damage it, honest. (laughs) So sometimes we have a problem, and it's like this thing in front of Well, God, take it away. God, take it away. Oh, I have this problem. It's not the guitar, you understand, just in case. This is representing a problem we have in our life. And sometimes we have a problem. We say, God, remove this problem. Send your angel to take away this problem. Oh, God, protect me from this problem. Take away this temptation. Take away this sin. Take away this thing. God, take it away because you like me. And God is saying, no, 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 no come over it because only when you come over do you become an overcomer 
And some of you this evening, I know you're struggling a little bit because you're saying, God, why don't you take this temptation away? Why don't you take this desire away? Why don't you remove this problem, remove this temptation? God has left it deliberately because he wants you to overcome it with his strength, with the power of his spirit. But you only become an overcomer when you come over the problem you're left with. But if the problem is so great, he will protect you from it. And therefore, we cannot say, there's one little thing we cannot say. And I hear English people say this. English Christians say this. I'm sure Danish Christians don't. They say this. Well, I did something wrong. I just couldn't resist it. I couldn't resist it. I slept with my girlfriend. We had sex. We're not married. I couldn't resist it. I was on this porno website for hours and hours. I just couldn't resist it. I stole this thing from the shop. I just couldn't resist it. I gossiped negatively and I lied. I just couldn't resist it. Now, any Christian who says, I couldn't resist it, is lying. Because we just read the Bible which says, if ever a temptation comes to us that we cannot bear, God will protect us from it. So he leaves you with a temptation. Why? So you can resist it. And so here's a word from Jesus for you. If ever you say, I just couldn't resist it. The word is stop lying. Stop lying. It's far more honest to say, hey, I didn't have to gossip. I could have resisted but I still did it. I could have resisted that temptation, but I still did it. Do you know what that's called? That's called confession. And confession sometimes is a little bit old-fashioned. But sometimes we have to confess to Jesus. I'm sorry, Jesus, I fell into that temptation. I'm sorry, Jesus, I did that. Do you know what that is? That is real. That is authentic. At least it's authentic when we say, oh God, I am so sorry I fell into that temptation. I gossiped, I stole, I had sex when I shouldn't have done. I watched a website, I shouldn't. I watched a film, I shouldn't. I read a book, I shouldn't. I behaved badly, I lied, I shouldn't have. Lord Jesus, I could have resisted, but I didn't. Please forgive me. That is honest. But it is not honest to say, I couldn't resist it. That's lying. Because Jesus says, whenever you are tempted, he will provide a way of escape. And if God is speaking to some of you this evening very clearly, and you know, yep, I've been lying. I've been saying I couldn't resist it. I've got to be a big man and a big woman and say, hey, sorry, Jesus. I blew it. Please forgive me. This evening, some of you need to receive prayer at the end because he wants to receive your confession. Because he can always work with clear confession, sorry Jesus, I blew it, please forgive me. What he struggles with is when we lie and say, I couldn't resist it. We've got to make sure we don't have to say that. One of the heroes I have in the Old Testament is Daniel. I love the story of Daniel. And in Daniel chapter 3, we have the fantastic story of three of Daniel's friends. Three of Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Let's call them Fred, Jack, and Bill. It's just easier. And so Daniel's three friends, they are pressed to succumb to the culture of the day. The king is called Nebuchadnezzar. He's built a huge, great, big statue made of gold. And everybody in the society is forced to bow down. The pressure of society was huge. And every single person meekly had to bow down before this statue and honor this pagan king. But Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, said, no, 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 we're not going to do that. Because it would be a denial of our God. Are some of you in situations in your school, in your family, in your college, in your workplace, where you're being pressed to compromise? Because the society around us tries to squeeze us into its mold. And that's what these three Hebrew men were under the pressure to be squeezed to fit, to just conform with society, to just go along with what everybody else is doing. 
And God wants you and me to be strong enough to have a strong holiness that we're able to stand up and say, no, I will not bow down to the pressures of society. I will not bow down to the pressures of the day. I will stand for King Jesus. You see, it's easy to stand for Jesus this evening. But what about Monday morning? What about Wednesday afternoon? What about Friday night? Will you and I still be standing for King Jesus then? Will we still be his ambassadors then? Will we still have a strong holiness then? Or will we bow down to the pressures around us? But Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they said, we will not bow down. We are followers of our Lord God Almighty. So because of that, they were tied up. And in Daniel chapter 3, it's a fantastic story. We haven't got time to read it. But the only things I want to point out is it says in verse 20, they were tied up. Okay, tied up. It says in verse 21, they were bound with ropes. They had ropes bound around them. And in verse 23, it says they were firmly tied. That's the only little bit we've got time to pick up on. They were firmly tied with ropes. And then as their punishment, because they refused to bow down to society of the day, they were thrown into a blazing furnace. They were thrown into a blazing furnace. But then we read these words. King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, didn't we throw three men in? And they said, certainly. And the king said, wow, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound. Their ropes had been burned off and unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of God. Do you know what the fantastic truth is here? The fire that was intended to kill them only burned off what was binding them. Have you thought that through? The fire that was intended to kill them only burned off what was binding them. Think about your life and my life. You see, God allows you to go through the fire. God allows you and me to go through seasons, as it were, in the fire of temptation, of pressure. But if he allows us to go through a season when we're in the fire, he does it to burn off our insecurities, to burn off our pride, to burn off our self-sufficiency, to burn off our ego, to burn off our self-confidence, our independence. I can do it. Our oversensitivity, our selfishness. These guys, the king planned that the fire would kill them. But the fire did not kill them. It only burned off what was binding them. And when God allows you to be in a fire circumstance, he's not left you there because he wants to kill you, but to burn off all those things that are not helpful to him. Did you notice they were free before they came out of the fire? You see, a lot of us say, God, take me out of the fire. Take me out of the fire. Take me out of the fire. Do you know what Jesus did here? He came with them in the fire. He didn't rescue them from the fire. He came and stood with them. He walked around with them in the fire. They are not delivered from the fire. They are delivered in the fire. Do you know why? Because God wants his people to be strong and holy. He wants us in the fire, but with our God protecting us. And that is what he did here. We have a saying, and the saying is this. A ship in a harbour is safe. But that is not what ships are built for. A ship in a harbour is safe. But that is not what ships are built for. A Christian hiding in a church is safe. But that's not what Christians are built for. When we gather with other Christians, it's to be strengthened, to bring praise to God, to become strong in our holiness, strong in our conviction of who Jesus is, but so that we can be sent out in Jesus' name with his authority. A ship in a harbour is safe. A Christian in church with lots of Christian friends is safe, but that is not what we're built for. And the truth is this, 
God knows when to lift you out and when to lift you, leave you in because he is not so concerned about whether you are comfortable. He wants to make you strong. Jesus is making you strong, not keeping you comfortable. And I want you to hear the word of Jesus this evening. If he has left you in a difficult environment, if you feel pressed, if you feel the pressure to bow down to the culture and society around you, I want to encourage you to be strong. And if you feel that you're saying, Jesus, why don't you rescue me? Take me out of this fire. Then I want to encourage you by saying, Jesus knows what he's doing. He doesn't want to cuddle you. He doesn't want to just keep you happy. He wants you strong. A holiness that he can be proud of. Robust holiness. Strong holiness. Not weak, fragile holiness. I want to finish with two stories. Both these stories are true. The first one involves a guy called Gordon MacDonald. He's an American pastor. Gordon MacDonald said this. Once... I was stranded in Hong Kong. I'd been bounced from a flight on Singapore Airlines and left at the airport. The airline people politely told me there's no chance of leaving for at least two days. So I booked a hotel room for the first night and went back to the airport next day. Hour after hour I sat there hoping a seat would open up on a flight and I'd be given a boarding pass so I could get home. But seated next to me, was a businessman who was clearly used to international travel. He was in the same situation as me. Suddenly, he got up and ran to the agent at the gate. I could tell that their conversation was quite lively. And when he returned, he was waving his boarding pass. Now let me tell you how it works, pal, he said. I went over there. I used every swear word and profanity I know. I told him what I thought of his airline and where he could shove it. I told him straight. And I got a seat on the next flight home. He flaunted his pass in front of me. So he said to me, go over there, do the same thing. You might get lucky. So Gordon McDonald says, I went to the same gate agent and said, sir, I've been told that if I get real mean and nasty with you, it's possible that you will give me a boarding pass. But honestly, I'm not that sort of guy. I don't believe in humiliating people, shouting, and I don't swear. Nevertheless, I'd love to get home to my family, to my kids. So do you think you could help me out? He said, leave it with me, sir. I'll see. I returned to my seat with optimism. I expected to be able to say to my friend, you see, there's another, a better way to get things done. And when that happened, he would probably express admiration for me and ask me about my faith in Jesus and I could share it with him. I really expected this. The conclusion of the matter was that the guy boarded the flight and headed home. I spent the next two days at Hong Kong airport. You see, have you ever asked God to lift you out of something and he doesn't? Gordon MacDonald was in this predicament at the airport and he's saying, God, take me out of this. But God in his wisdom left him in it. And there are some occasions when God will leave you with a pressure. Some occasions when he will lead you through the wilderness. Some occasions when he will lead you with the fire. He'll leave you in a temptation. He will leave you there. Why? Because he wants you to grow up and be a strong Christian man, a strong Christian woman with robust holiness that says, through Christ, I can do all things. Too many people have that verse from Philippians in their head, but not in their soul. And when God leaves you in a situation, he has not done it because he's forgotten you. He's not done it because he hates you. He's not done it because he doesn't love you. In fact, he's done it because he wants you to be strong and represent him in this world. He wants you to be a flag bearer for the kingdom of light, a flag bearer for the kingdom of joy, for the kingdom of hope, for the kingdom of peace. He wants you to be in this culture, in this society, being strong and representing him with a strong holiness. That is his mission. And if 
He leaves you in it. He knows what he's doing. But my final story involves a friend of mine called Mike. And he was a missionary many years ago in Indonesia. And he was the first Christian to go to Indonesia many years ago to try to build a church. He and his wife and his little girl had been there just a few months. And late one night, suddenly in the darkness, they heard a huge, huge crowd and a noise of shouting. And then they saw lots of people with sticks of wood with flames on, these flaming torches. And they came to his house and his house had a wall all the way around it. And he heard the shouting and he saw the fire and he got a little bit fearful and he pulled his wife and he pulled his little daughter and he pulled a couple of people who were with him and said, God, we've got to pray, Jesus, please. These were the Muslims in that area who had come to kill them. And they prayed, Jesus, please protect us. Please save us. And then they saw these people climbing the walls. And they saw these people sitting on the walls, ready to jump down and run across and kill them. Then suddenly, it all went quiet. The people climbed down and they all went away. And that was the end of that. Do you know, it was almost two years later before my friend was chatting to one of the Muslims who lived nearby who had decided to follow Jesus. He eventually became a Christian. And my friend Mike said, do you remember not long after we came, a big crowd coming around our house? He says, oh yes. He says, I was in that crowd. We came to kill you. What? Yeah. We're not having this foreign religion of Christianity. We're not having this name of Jesus. And so the people in the area said, come on, let's kill these Christian Western missionaries. Let's go and sort them out. So we came and we went all around your house and we had our torches and we were going to throw them and set fire to the house. And we climbed the walls and we're there and we're ready to jump down and run across. And he says, and we were going to kill you and burn your house down. And Mike said, what happened? He says, well, we didn't know you had protection. And Mike said, What do you mean, protection? He says, well, just as our leader was about to jump down, suddenly a big line of huge tall men stepped forward and stood right in front of the house. And he said, we thought it was stupid because what army in their right mind wears white uniforms? And they were huge, these soldiers. And Mike says, we didn't have any soldiers. And he says, We counted them and thought, no, no, we can take them on. And just as we're going to jump, they step forward and another line of huge white soldiers step behind them with bright white uniforms. By the time we finished, there were five lines of huge white uniformed soldiers standing in our way. So we went home. And Mike said to me, I've always believed in angels, but I didn't realize what God was doing that night. I hope you believe in angels. I hope you believe that God will protect you. I hope you have such a confidence in your spirit that God will never, ever, ever allow anything to damage you and wipe you out. Like the Philistines, like the fire, like the temptation, like the pressure, He will always step in and rescue you. But if He leaves you in, it's because He wants you strong. Jesus wants a strong people who will faithfully represent him. Can I ask that we stand? Because I want to pray with you. And some of you in a moment, I'm going to ask you to go and be prayed with this folk at the back who will love to pray with you. Maybe you want to pray with somebody next to you. But I know that God has spoken this evening. I know that there are some people and you've got to stop saying to yourself, couldn't resist it. Be honest, I could resist it, but I didn't. But Jesus, I want to be holy. There are also others of you who at this time, you're thinking, Jesus, I thought you were supposed to love me. Why am I in this problem? Why am I in this pressure? Why do I feel like I'm in a fire? Because God is working on you. He wants you to become what he needs you to be. Jesus loves you just as you are but he loves you too much to leave you as you are. Which is why his spirit works in your life and my life and helps us to become strong in him. Don't be over here with no holiness. 
Don't be over here with a weak, fragile holiness. Be right in the middle of society with a strong, robust holiness, standing for King Jesus, bringing his life, his hope, his peace, his joy into the society to which he's called us. And so as I pray, I'm going to pray. Then the guys are going to run with it. Maybe if Silas comes. Hi, Silas. He's a good man. He's a good man. I know he, I know he looks a bit strange, but he's a good man. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> now, do you know why I wanted to do this? Don't go all religious on me. Some churches go all religious now. We don't need to go religious. Jesus loves you. Jesus wants to do something good in your life. And some of us need to pray with others. Some of us need to be prayed with. Some of us need to sing the song of worship. But please respond to what God has said to you. Don't be a participant. Don't be a spectator. Be a participator. Participate in what God's doing. Father God, I want to thank you for these men and women. I want to thank you, Lord God, that you are somehow stirring a movement here, a movement of your people. And I ask in the name of Jesus that the kingdom of heaven would come to Denmark like never before. I pray that every single man and woman here would have a confidence that you will always lift them out of a pressure, of a temptation, of a fire, of a circumstance that you know they can't handle. And even if, like the children of Israel, they think they can do it, if you know they can't please Jesus lift them out of that pressure but Lord God you love these guys so much that many of them you've left in places of pressure places of turmoil not because you hate them but because you love them so much you are working on their life to help them to become strong forgive us Jesus when we think you want to make us comfortable and help us to have confidence that you want to make us bold, want to make us strong, so that we will not bow to the culture of today, but we will instead change the culture of today in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I pray that you would help each of these men and women to become overcomers by overcoming by the power of your Spirit, whatever you allow them to go through, for their sake, for the sake of your kingdom in Denmark, and for the sake of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I prophesy in Jesus' name that each man and each woman here would become what you've destined them to be, that they would be standing strong, and instead of being affected by society, they would affect society and be a strong Christian culture for the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Go and be prayed for straight away, those of you who need to be.